Right, we're coming to the Word of God, and one or two of you will be joining us online, and we welcome you to share with us. We have read earlier in the service from Isaiah chapter 55. I'm not preaching from Isaiah 55, but it's a way of introducing our theme this morning. It's a wonderful chapter. Wonderful book. Amongst the scholars through the years, the prophecy of Isaiah, his book, he's been considered to be the most evangelistic of all the prophets. Many, many passages, there's a call to come to God, to come back to God, to recognize your need of God, etc. That goes on and on through the book. Um, it's there in our chapter we've read this morning, chapter 55. An invitation to the thirsty to come. An invitation of those who have no food. Come, we don't need money. Not practical food. Come and receive from God the blessings he has for you that will feed you, will support you, will strengthen you, etc. Come and receive from God's grace. And the chapter goes on to say God fully satisfies our needs. Anybody can come. Just come. That's the message of chapter 55. Just come. Enter into a covenant of love and relationship with the living God. That's what he wants us to do. So, seek the Lord while he can be found. Call upon him while he is near. Joy and blessing will then follow when you do this. And your life will be different. The everlasting result of effective evangelism in Isaiah's time for his nation, or in our day and age of our generation, the effective proof of this is that you have fruit that will last, fruit that remains. So there you are, in a matter of a minute and a half or so. That's the synopsis of Isaiah 55, 1 to 12. You say, oh, just a minute, there's 13 verses. Yes, there are 13 verses. And it finishes, instead of the thorn bush, will grow the pine tree. Instead of the briars, will grow the myrtle. And this will be for the Lord's renown, his name as an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. There are two words there put together which actually go into our, our message this morning. Instead of. Instead of. Those two words put together mean there's a change. Something's changed or is changing. Something's happened. Something's different. Now for us as Christian believers, we <coughs> believers here this morning or listening in, when we first became a Christian there was a change. Something happened in our life and uh, you look back to that moment in time and you say, instead of, my life has changed. Instead of pleasing myself, going my own way, living my sort of life, everything centering on me and those around me, God came into my life and now God has this place in my life where he has this importance. Christ Jesus becomes central. Instead of this, it's this. Change has taken place. That's our conversion, isn't it? There's something missing, there's something absolutely wrong. If you can't say that there was an instead of in your life or mine. But then as we go on in life, in the Christian life, there are, there are instead of, I hope, all the time. We learn things as we go. Instead of this, it's this. A little bit more prayer, a little bit more discipline. And this, this isn't helping. So instead of this, this. I hope you find this is occurring in your life as time goes by. Old things passed away, says Paul. All things becoming new. 
So this morning I hope we can all say, myself included, since that first instead of, I've grown in the faith. I've grown deeper in understanding in Christian things. Oh, I've got a lot to learn. We always have and always will have. But I've also sought to have a closer walk with God and a clearer view of Christ. Greater effect on my life. Instead of what it used to be, it's becoming more like it should be. Haven't arrived yet, but we're, we're, we're moving on. I'm entitled a message this morning, Going and Growing. We should be going on with, with God and we should be growing in the faith and becoming more and more as our Lord is. For all of us, life is a journey, isn't it? To put that into Christian terms, a Christian life is a journey. Just think for a moment that first Easter evening. Those two friends going home to Emmaus, they are homeward bound. Oh, they were sad. Disillusioned. The one they'd begun to put their trust in, they'd crucified him. Buried him. It's all finished. Their hearts were in bewilderment. Their minds, sad, cast down. And as they journey home feeling like this, a stranger joins them, doesn't he? And step by step of the way, gradually he opens up to the scriptures, from the prophets especially, and probably Isaiah certainly, explaining himself to them. They get home. And there comes that point where suddenly they realise he's here. He's alive. He's risen from the dead. Now you see him instead of. Instead of the sadness, the gloom, the darkness, the hopelessness, the uncertainty. Now instead of all this, there's hope, joy, peace. That's a tremendous instead of. It's a wonderful picture of it. <clears throat> so I ask myself, and I ask you this morning, how are you doing in this? How are you doing? How are you getting on? Are you growing up? Are you going on? And is your life as a Christian being fruitful? Fruit that lasts. Just staying with these two words instead of for a couple more moments. The Apostle Peter writes in his first letter, Through Christ we have been given a new birth and a new inheritance. Something not second-hand or touched up, knocked about and changed. Something that's brand new. We have a new life in Christ which is so different. Instead of what was, this is what is. Increasingly so. Next chapter in Peter, 1 Peter 2. He says, we've been called out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Once you were here, way off from God, now you're here with God and getting closer to God. Instead of. This is why we read together from Philippians chapter 3, that passage from Paul. Not my righteousness, he writes, but for all of us that which comes from God by faith. We haven't got any righteousness. Scripture says our righteousness is it's like filthy rags. Worthless. Nothing beauty, in, no beauty at all. That righteousness which comes from God by faith. So, with that faith, Paul says we press on toward the goal of the prize which God has called us in Christ Jesus. Fight the good fight with your son. Continue in that race of life with your son. Go on to that goal, that prize in Christ. Instead of this, instead of what has been, now it's this. It's changing. There is one passage in the scriptures which perhaps 
more than most, given us a wonderful picture of this. And uh, I want you not to turn, you haven't got your Bibles, but um, I'm going to turn to mine, and I think it'll come up on the screen. Hebrews chapter 12, which I gather you, you had reading last week. <coughs> so, in that case, I think God's got something to teach you. <coughs> it comes up like this. I want to just say some things about verses 1 and 2. This is an instead little passage. Clear passage. Instead of. What does it say? Therefore, since we all oh, therefore, that means it's following something that's gone before. What goes before chapter 12? Chapter 11. Chapter 11 is chapter of faith. Therefore, in light of what you read in chapter 11, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. It goes on to say, consider him. four words I give to you from these two verses here this morning. There's inspiration here. There's examination here. There's determination here. And there's concentration here. Let me show you. It's up there on the screen. The inspiration. This great cloud of witnesses. The examination. Throw off, cast aside all those things which hinder you in your Christian life. There's determination, run with perseverance, endurance, the race that's before us. And the concentration, you fix your gaze on Jesus. And with the time remaining, I just want to draw your thoughts to these four things. Very briefly, very simply. Inspiration. Look, Frank, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. This follows on from the chapter 11, the therefore. This great cloud of witnesses, this Old Testament gallery of saints. We've got here Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah. We've got Moses, Gideon, Samson, David. Samuel, they're, they're there. And the writer of the Hebrews said, there's so many out there, we haven't got time or space to write them. This great cloud of witnesses. What do you make of this? I personally, I don't know about you, but I personally find this very helpful. This great cloud of unseen witnesses, they're in glory and willingness and urging us on. Amongst them, one or two of those are my, my family. Some of those are in my past ministries. They're urging us on. They pray for us. They cheer us. We've had the, all these athletic things going on in the TV in the last few weeks. And when some of the, uh, when some of the athletes are interviewed, what got you to this medal? What got you? It was the crowd. They carried me through. This is what these, these witnesses should be doing. They want to carry us through. They fought the fight. They've overcome. They won. They want us to do the same. Well, I find that helps. That encourages my heart. Perhaps it does you too. So is that what's meant here? Well, no, not really. No, it helps. The primary meaning we have in this cloud of witnesses is not, it's their testimony. It's not the folk, it's the faith. That's what matters. They're God's witnesses to us that they have fought the fight, they've come through, they've been used by God and they've enjoyed God. That should inspire us. That should, 
that should inspire us and urge us on. They were people of faith. We're not going through the list this morning. Just one or two obvious examples. Noah. Noah lived in a day that was very godless. God comes to Noah, who's a righteous man. Noah, I want you to build a very large boat. It was large, had two floors. Enormous. You want me, Lord, to build a boat here in this desert region? Yes. You want me to build a boat in the desert region, there's not one cloud in the sky? Yes. Without any question, Noah starts work with his family. Eight of them build this large boat. God says there's a storm coming. There is the ark built in a desert region with a beautiful sky. A man of faith. A man who trusted his God. Abraham. Abraham, I want you to pack up all your belongings, which you've got a lot of. You've got a large family. You've got lots and lots of flocks and herds. I want you to pack everything up and I want you to set out on a journey. I'm not telling you where, but I'll tell you when you arrive. Not one word of question. Not one well, Lord, I'd like to know why and what. Not one question. The next morning, he starts to say to everybody, come on, we're moving on. God's told me. We're going in faith to wherever he chooses. Moses, sending you back to Egypt. You're going to set my people free. Who shall I say send me? I am. The I am. The one who is in all, above all, made all, and always will be. I am the never changing God. I'm sending you back. With my people, freedom. And what proof? I'll give you proof, God said. When you come to see water, you will raise your staff in your hand and call on my name. And that water will open up and you will go through. Thousands of you. And then when you're through, the waters will come back and Egypt will be no more for you. Slavery is finished. Instead of slavery, it's freedom. Instead of. You're on your way to your promised land. This is what God can do with people, you see, who have real faith. Well, no, it's not so much the people themselves. It's what God does when people have faith in God. It's what God does through them. So we're surrounded by this great, encouraging group of people spurring us on. And it's the same living, loving, mighty, wonderful God who we worship and know today. He hasn't changed one bit. I am the Lord God. I change not. Still the same God. Circumstances are very different. But I hope you agree with me. He's still doing wonderful things for those who believe and allow. That's the inspiration. Secondly, the examination, very briefly. Let us throw off, cast away everything that hinders us from going on. Sin can entangle us. We call this self-examination. Any act of commitment to God is going to be tested and it's got to be prepared for. We've got to live a life that pleases God, a holy God. Some things have to go. But if they go, other things will come from God that will replace them even better. We read this morning from Isaiah. Isaiah really starts in chapter 6. Many go back to chapter 1. Chapter 6, this young man Isaiah then, he goes up to the temple to mourn the death of a very good king, King Isaiah. Goes up to mourn and to pay his respects and probably to pay for his nation at the time. And uh, while he's there in that temple, God's presence comes in all its holiness and all its power and wonder. Whole place is full of his glory. I saw the Lord, he says, I lifted up. You see something else. 
He sees himself. Oh, woe is me. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here in the presence of the Holy God. I'm not worthy. I have no right to be here at all. Woe is me. Then in a symbolic form, an angel comes and takes from the altar in the temple an ember and from, from, from fire, puts that on him to cleanse him. Now he's going to be called by God to be a prophet. God says you're going to be a messenger. His prophetic ministry begins with self-examination. In a moment we'll be having communion together and uh, Paul says when you come to the communion table you should examine your hearts and minds, self-examination, lest you partake in a Oh, hindrances can come. Things can weigh in upon our life. The old life will usurp itself again and again. We'll fail at times. We'll falter. We'll, 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 yes. We'll make mistakes. We'll get in the way sometimes. But God is there. He understands. And when things go wrong, John assures us the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Everything on our part, with the Spirit of God's help, we should cast out those things which get in the way and hinder our Christian life, so that we can press on and grow in faith fast more strongly. A word about determination. We got a picture of the race, and with the television that we've had recently, with all the racing going on, let us run with perseverance. All the way endurance, the race which is marked out for us. It takes determination to run a race. You don't just turn up on the day and say, well, I bought me, I bought me, I bought me sneakers, I'm, I'm going to run. Good gracious. Then I finished the race before you'd started, really. Now you've got to prepare for it, you've got to work for it. Amazing what some of the athletes can now do. It's not a sprint. The Christian life is not a sprint. I've heard it likened very much to a uh, marathon. Well, it is a marathon, but some people enjoy it. I've got a friend who enjoys marathons. I say to him, what on earth do you, what do you think about when you're running several miles? It's all sorts of things. Well, that's his idea of leisure. I don't think the Christian life is a marathon. I think it's a steeple chase. That's a hard, hard race. Not only are you running and running and running a number of laps, but you've got to get over hurdles on the way. You've got to go through water on the way. You've got wet feet, tight limbs. You've got to keep going. Oh, that's a tough race. And so is the Christian life. The many things which will come to try and put us off. Perseverance, endurance, is the same Greek word that's used for both of those. It's here in Hebrews 12, take my word for it, it's up here in verse 1, it's up here in verse 2, it's also in verse 3, it's also in verse 7. Going on, going on, persevering, endurance. Many people sadly give up. Going's too tough. Yeah, being a Christian can be tough. If you're the only Christian where you work or the only Christian in your home, it can be tough. Some parts of the world, it can be a matter of life or death or imprisonment or freedom. There will always be opposition, just as there was to Jesus in his message. There can be strong currents against you. It can be uphill. It can be lonely. In fact, you can take everything we've got. And yet, it's an adventure, it's a challenge, it's a life to which Christ calls you and he calls me and he says in the process, I shall be with you always. He's there all the way. So we run, I hope, with determination, with endurance and perseverance. Don't give up with you. Jesus said, he who stands firm, now I like the old edition which says, he who endures to the end will be saved. That's Matthew 10, verse 22. Keep going, won't you? 
And finally that brings us to the concentration. Let us fix, verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. He's the author because that's where our faith starts. That's where it begins. And that which he begins, he'll continue to do as we allow him to. He'll begin to mature us and process us. And uh, he'll go on to complete it. We fix our eyes on him and work with him. It's not a stare. I like to think of it as a gaze. We gaze. And I like the way the writer in Hebrew does put it. He doesn't say look to the Lord. The Bible tells us that in many places we look to the Lord and look to God. He says look to Jesus. And that says to me, that's a human name, that's Jesus. We're not called to look to religion, we're not called to look to uh, doctrine, or creeds, church, practice or methods or anything like this. Look to a person, Jesus. And Jesus is the one who's been here on earth and he knows what it is to walk this journey. He's done it. He understands. He knows best. I'm glad the name Jesus is here. We look to him, he understands. Jesus who is our example. This passage tells us the one who endured the cross, faced the shame, the ignominy. The Jesus who God raised from the dead. We're told here the Jesus who is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's who he looked at. Many claims on your life and mine, many calls for your interest, your support in all sorts of ways, lots of things which justify but Jesus has a claim on your life and mine too if we claim to be a believer. Why? Because we belong to him. And as this table represents, we've been bought with a price. We belong to him. So as I draw our thoughts to a close, we have, if we seek and look and find, we shall find much inspiration from the many ways, the many things which testify that God can do wondrous things in all sorts of ways and through sometimes the most unexpected people, even us perhaps. Inspiration. We're being urged on by those who've gone before. Examination, we look into our life and we bring out those things and get rid of those things which hinder and spoil, tarnish. Determination, a new resolve, a dedication. To go on and to go on and to gain greater, greater sense of God's presence in our life. And the concentration, we fix our gaze on Jesus, looking to Jesus. Jesus, name above all names, I pray while the offering is being taken. The Jesus who is our Saviour, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in the believer's ear, wrote John Hume. That's who we fix our gaze on. I'm going to close by reminding you finally of something that's very obvious here, but very, very easy to just overlook. Looking to Jesus. The Greek word here is look away, look away. And if you look away to Jesus, you're looking away from your little world and you're looking away from yourself. With all your experience and your know-how and your ideas and your plans and your little world, much of which is so important, but you're looking away from yourself, you're looking to the one who is your Lord and Saviour. When you're doing that, you can't see two things as it were at the same time. Clearly, you're not looking at yourself, you're looking at Jesus. And as you look at Jesus, you're going to grow closer to him because you're going to get to know him. You're going to see him more in your life at work, in the life of others, in the church you fellowship with. I finish with the words of that chorus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful great face. The things of 
of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory, his grace. Let's spend a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, you called us to a high calling. You set our feet on a very important road. You set before us a very big goal. But Lord, in your love and grace, you enable us to do this. The more we lean upon you and trust you in faith, the more we fix our gaze upon the one who should be our example, our leader, our saviour, our Lord and King, so may we grow closer to him and more like him, the Lord who one day we shall meet and see for ourselves, our King in all his beauty. Keep us trusting, we pray, so much in this day and age against us. The Lord, you do not change and your love is constant. Keep us faithful to you. We pray in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. For those of you who have uh, tuned in with us, thank you and pray God's blessing on you.